Hello, I'm Dr. Louise Newson. I'm a GP and menopause specialist, and I'm also the founder of the Newson Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre here in Stratford upon Avon. I'm also the founder of the Free Balance app. Each week on my podcast, join me and my special guests where we discuss all things perimenopause and menopause. We talk about the latest research, bust myths on menopause symptoms and treatments, and often share moving and always inspirational personal stories. This podcast is brought to you by the Newson Health Group, which has clinics across the UK dedicated to providing individualised perimenopause and menopause care for all women. So I've got with me Anita Nicholson, who's a nurse practitioner from Portland, Maine in America. And I met her at a conference. We were both at a conference recently, a menopause conference. And I was presenting some of my um, work from our clinic about testosterone and benefits. And we met at coffee and the coffee break wasn't long enough, actually, because we were chatting and sharing our experiences of the patients we see and the journeys that they have had before they come and see us and the transformational way that we can help them. And it was just lovely to speak to a kindred spirit, actually, who understood what we're trying to do and try and improve the lives of so many people. So thanks for joining me today, Anita. It's very exciting to see you again. Yes, Louise, thank you for inviting me. So you're a nurse practitioner and you've had a really interesting background, actually, haven't you? Looking at, um, you know, I think things change, don't they, with time, how you want to reduce diseases and Mm. improve longevity. And it's the journey to that age, not the age that we die necessarily. Yes. Certainly how I practice medicine or think about medicine, about prevention rather than waiting for the disease to come is quite different than if you'd met me 30 years ago when I had just trained in medicine. And so what's your journey been like? Uh, s- similar. I spent probably 20 years in hospital paced medicine, mm. ICU, cardiac surgery, cardiology, um, and found I really wanted to get ahead of people having heart attacks. Mm. And through my own journey through menopause, which was Um, related to chemotherapy. So I went right off the deep end into menopause, really struggled to navigate that. And I thought, if I'm struggling, other women must be struggling. And I'd really like to get ahead of all of this disease that will happen to us later in life. So I started to shift my career to real primary prevention and focusing on women's health only. So now I only see women in my clinic. Yes, which is nothing wrong with the men. There's plenty of men here to take care of them. Absolutely. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, I I'm not like you. I'm not a gynecologist. I'm not an OBGYN. Mm -hmm. And I've done a lot of hospital medicine. And um, actually, even as a junior, as a medical student, we had did an elective and I did it with a cardiothoracic unit. And, Mm -hmm. um, And it was very interesting. And I love cardiology, I love treating diseases, and I really enjoyed hospital medicine. And I never once thought that I would set up and run a clinic that was just for women. Like like you, I love women, but I also love helping men and children and all sorts. But but actually life just has, you know, takes it sort of different directions and you go with the direction if it feels right. And, you know, we're only talking about something that affects 51% 51% of the population right. directly, yes. but every woman knows a man, whether they live with them or they're related to them or they work with them. So it has an indirect effect on the rest. So there's nothing else in medicine that affects every single person other than hormonal health, is there? That's true. Yeah, we if, if women live long enough, it will happen to them mm. and everyone in their life. Yes is affected as well. Yes. And it's it's really interesting because the conversation changes all the time. But for what I was going to say decades, but it's centuries, actually, women have been ignored. And people have been very scared of hormones because hormones affect for many women their emotions as well, Mm -hmm. and the way their brains Mm -hmm. work and their personalities and Mm -hmm. the way they function. And people have been scared of that. And then even when they realize there's been all sorts of weird treatments over the decades, hasn't there to try Mm -hmm. and 
calm women down or to suppress them or to help them with their depressive symptoms or reduce mm -hmm. their anxiety, um, all sorts of often quite barbaric treatments. Um, and um, now we've moved on. We know that a lot of symptoms are related to hormonal deficiencies or fluctuations, mm -hmm. depending whether someone's menopausal or perimenopausal. And we have really safe natural hormones to replace that deficit. Mm -hmm. But over in the UK, only about 14% of women who are menopausal take hormones. Over in the US, I think it's even less, isn't it? Maybe 10, maybe mm. less. Mm. Yes, mm. It's, it's still quite low. Yeah, which there's nothing else in medicine, in my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, where we have an evidence-based treatment that is um, not given to the majority of people that are suffering from the condition. It's true. Yes. If you, you can look at the percentages from many different, um, you know, data that's collected, which is hard to do when you don't have an FDA approved testosterone, mm. for instance. Mm. So where is prescribing happening? And it's, you know, how many prescriptions of male testosterone was filled <laughs> yes. for a female? And what about the compounding pharmacies and, and whatnot? But even if you look at the, <clears throat> there was a, um, there was a research query, 2010 to 2021, um, like 190,000 women, 40,000 of who had diagnosed um, hypoactive sexual desire, mm. and 3.9% treated. 3.9. So, 3.9. So I think that would be considered rarely prescribed. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you know, and that wouldn't be the case if it was, we found that they had high cholesterol, or we found that they had hypertension, or they yeah. just pick one, I know. you know, it wouldn't be 3.9%. Yeah. Which is quite shocking, because if yes. you look at, if we sort of think about HSDD, as you said, hyperactive sexual desire disorder, it's, it's very common in menopausal women, and actually perimenopausal women, and even younger women as well. Yes. But even if you look at the way it's defined, it's mm. quite barbaric for women, isn't it? Yes. I don't love the um, that it's a desire disorder. Mm. It's, it's not a desire disorder. And I also don't, um, <clears throat> I don't love the wording around, but you really have to be suffering. Yes. Yes. I really don't like that either. And <clears throat> you have to be suffering ooh. for the minimum of at least three months. So you right. can't just have a month or six weeks of suffering. You have to wait right. until you have three months. And whose judgment is that? Well, this is really suffering interesting. Suffering enough. Yes. Yeah. I've, I don't I love that. I feel like in life, many of us suffer for all sorts of reasons. There's all sorts mm -hmm. of reasons why our libido can change. And it often is situational, of course. But there are still other reasons, including low hormones, that can affect our desire. But it's a desire for what? And that's what I find really difficult, because if mm -hmm. you look at Freud's interpretation of libido, it's not just about sexual pleasure. It's about pleasure of life and enjoyment of life. And is it really wrong for us as clinicians to want to enable our patients to have better quality of life and enjoy life more? And I don't think it is, actually. But it seems yeah. like we have to prove that we're suffering a lot before we can get any enjoyment. And that doesn't seem right either. No. And how do you even ask that? But are you suffering enough? And and is there any domestic situation that could be affecting this? Yeah. This is not a conversation that men have. No. With, with, with patient, male patients, you know, who no. may present and say, the same array of symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's anxiety, maybe there's some mood change, there's no um, sex drive is gone, you know, cannot maintain an erection, cannot achieve orgasm. They're not going to dive into what's your home life, how much are you suffering, mm -hmm. that, that, that conversation doesn't happen. They get no. to treatment, mm -hmm. and that's the end of it. And yeah. I, I think we need to treat our our women patients like that. We, we don't I need to I make a judgment do. on, no. are you suffering enough? No. And I do like your point about um, inviting pleasure into our lives, mm. especially at this stage of our life. 
we have enough experience and wisdom and knowledge of our own self Mm. to be able to cultivate pleasure everywhere in our life, Mm. not just intimately, Mm. you know, find the joy, feel the joy with our intimate partners, any other place in our life. And what I have found very consistently with women that 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 feeling of being able to connect with joy and pleasure drains out of their body Mm. when they go through perimenopause and menopause. And it's hard for them to really pinpoint when it happened, Mm. but they know that it has happened. They know that they're in an experience where this, I used to feel joyful right now in this circumstance, whatever it is, but I can't connect with that anymore. And that, that touches every part of their life, not just their intimate life. And it can be devastating. Yeah. And it's and really, it's not that they're depressed, no, but being no. in that state for a prolonged period of time yeah. can be depressing. I absolutely agree. And um it, it's really hard to sort of put down in a on a questionnaire or in a research tool or mm-hmm. whatever, but it is that people often say, I just feel joyless, I feel flat, mm-hmm. my mm-hmm. zest for mm-hmm. life has gone. It's quite um sort of subtle changes that often come on quite gradually. Um, And the more we learn and know about physiology of our hormones, so the more how our hormones, estrogen, progesterone, and and testosterone can light up our brains, it's no surprise. And when we talk about HSDD, it's talked a lot in the context of testosterone. Um, Mm -hmm. And so we've talked on many podcasts before about the role of estrogen and progesterone, which are sort of the building blocks almost. We've always been the go-to parts Mm -hmm. of HRT. But testosterone is an independent hormone. It's produced by our ovaries, our adrenal glands, but our brain produces testosterone as well, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And we have receptors for testosterone all over our body, including our brain. And it actually blew my brain when I first realized this because I felt really cheated as a woman who has had this biologically active hormone in my body at higher dose, at higher levels when I was younger than, than, than when I was older, but also as a, as a clinician. Why didn't anyone tell me that women had testosterone and it has this effect? And then as a menopause specialist, I've also felt cheated because whenever we have or I've gone to uh, presentations about testosterone or educational events, it's always been testosterone HSDD, severely psychologically distressed with their reduced libido and then considered testosterone. Mm -hmm. No one's been saying about all the other biological effects that testosterone has. So it's, I don't know about you, were you given much education over the years about testosterone? No, that was not covered in any of my training. This menopause care right now is an independent education. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly... um, prepare for and get certified by the menopause society. Yes, do that. Um, Sometimes the guidelines aren't up to date. So you write a test that you have to, you know, bear in mind uh, what year the test is. Um, But otherwise it's an independent study on your own dime. Mm. Right. So if you want to become specialized in menopause care, you're doing a lot of self-study on your own, on your own dime. Absolutely. And many of us are really motivated because the more you do perimenopause and menopause care, the more you realize it's transformational medicine. There's nothing else I've ever managed in medicine where I've had patients who feel better, but also their future health is better as well. And um, when I first started learning about uh, testosterone, in fact, the conference we met at, I'd gone to a similar conference actually seven years ago. It was um, my first menopause conference. It was in Amsterdam. And um, I had just started taking testosterone about four months before. Mm-hmm. And I have, was experiencing this joy that I hadn't had for like 10 years. Mm-hmm. I'd, I thought a lot of my sort of sadness and ineptness and just loss of self-esteem and low self-worth was just because I'd had my third child when I was 40 I thought I'm just a bit old to be a mother again I was trying to change my career I was trying to set up a clinic I was doing all these things I and then suddenly my brain literally felt like it was opening up and Mm -hmm. a light again is all I can say really and I was I could jump out of bed rather than thinking I'm going to hit snooze 28 times before I get out of bed but I went to a lecture uh, by an Italian professor 
And he was talking about the benefits of testosterone beyond libido um, or sexual, you know, libido. <laughs> and he was said, I remember going to the opera with my wife and it's the most wonderful opera we're there you know listening and I look at her and she's crying she's got tears of enjoyment because the music is just so wonderful and I think to myself that's testosterone that's done that it's given her this tingling yes. sensation this enjoyment and I came out of the lecture theatre thinking yes that's what I'm getting really you know I was really invigorated and I turned to two of my colleagues um, and said oh, that's testosterone is amazing and I stupidly said to them Oh, do you take testosterone? And they both looked poker face and said, no, I don't need it. And I thought, okay, I've really just overstepped probably all professional and personal mm-hmm. boundaries here. And then I realized that actually maybe I was oversharing, telling people that I was on a, a hormone. I don't know why. but And then I got told off actually for talking about it in public. But actually, lot, like lots of things in any experience you learn more from yourself but then it makes you understand like why is my brain feeling like this let me go back and look at some neuroanatomy and neurophysiology texts oh mm-hmm. well, okay i can understand now why it's working so it, it's unlikely to be just a placebo isn't it oh it absolutely is is not a placebo and we should be talking about it mm. we should like make everyone very comfortable talking about women's health and women's hormones and what it means and what the change is. I have patients who consistently tell me I have saved their life Mm. and they mean it. I have other um, women who have said, you know, I feel incredibly better. You know, there's, you know, I'm back to my life again. I uh, feel re-engaged with my friends. I started my hobbies again. I'm motivated to go to the gym. I feel excitement for things. And none of those are sexual. Mm. None of those are sexual. They're, they're um, back into enjoying their lives again and getting stronger Mm. and feeling more confident. Mm. And I would say there's um, consistently a message of somewhere along the way when you're, when your hormones go down and I think estrogen plays a role in this and a lot of different things do too, but we lose the sensation or the understanding or the connection of our feminine energy mm. of our um our sensuality our sexuality this is a personal feeling and you don't need to have a partner to to feel that way in your body and your life and your mind and your spirit and and it and it disappears mm. and women struggle to feel i don't feel attractive i don't feel sexual i don't feel that in my body. I don't feel it when I look at myself, when I'm talking, all of those things. And that's not made up. That's a consistent message that I get from women. And when they start on hormone replacement therapy, and some I've only ever started on testosterone, that comes back and they can feel that again. They can feel their their sexual identity again. They can feel their feminine energy and that sensuality. And that they then go forth in their life and, and, and connect and do the things that they've loved to do or find new things to do, relate to their partner in a different way. That is a consistent message. Yes. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of the guidelines, well, all the guidelines actually that I can think of say that we have to give HRT first if women still have reduced libido despite being on HRT considered testosterone. But Mm. actually the more work I do and I learn every day from patients that we see, is that I think, and I'm really keen to hear what you think, there's a lot more women out there who are testosterone deficient before they become estrogen deficient. Yes. Um, do, you, do you see that in your practice? I yeah. do. I have women in their late 30s mm-hmm. and on who are in perimenopause. Um, I know we don't have the data on this. This is just my clinical observation. Mm-hmm. Many of them have been on oral birth control for a very long time, right up until their 30s when they decided to have babies. And most of them say, I just didn't bounce back after my last child. Um, those women have very low testosterone and have all the symptoms of testosterone depletion. And I start them on testosterone. Uh, on its own before? On its own, yeah. yes. Yeah. And, that and then we difference. talk about perimenopause and what, it, you know, what will happen next when progesterone goes, when estrogen leaves the building, 
you know, I think of estrogen as the queen of everything lubricated, eyeballs to vagina, you know, you're going to notice it and, you know, certainly talk about it right away when it starts to happen. Um, so I, I definitely have, I have a cohort of women on the young side and my older ladies who are maybe, you know, 68 to 75, and they're keenly feeling the lack of stamina and ability to maintain their muscle mass and um, just their sort of mojo, their get up and go. This is what they, they tell me. Um, only testosterone for them. Game changer. And it's interesting because some clinicians get quite scared of giving testosterone without estrogen. Um, and people talk about this aromatization of testosterone to estrogen. But actually, our hormones come from the same pathway anyway, don't they? That's right. Um, yes. They're very similar when you look at their chemical structure. Mm -hmm. Estrogen, progesterone, mm -hmm. testosterone are very similar. And some might convert to estrogen, but it's very low and it's not enough to really have an effect. And we have to remember that people have estrogen endogenously anyway in their bodies. That's right. Um, and um, even when people are postmenopausal, there's still some estrogen production mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and, and, and so testosterone is an independent hormone. And I often say to people, if you had a patient who was hypothyroid and had type 1 diabetes, would you say to them, right, I'm going to give you thyroxine today and then I'm going to give you insulin in three months' time? It just doesn't make sense. No. Yeah, you're exactly right. I tell people that estrogen and progesterone are a couple mm. and testosterone plays in his own sandbox. <laughs> Completely different. Yes. They work well together, but they can be given separately. Yes. And sometimes yes. I start women only on estrogen and progesterone to begin and then add in testosterone. Other times I start testosterone first. It depends on, um, you know, each woman is their care is so individual. Of course it is. It's so individual. Yeah. And what I think the the complaint or the um, thing that is highest on their suffering scale, if you will, is, is what I tend to go with first if they only want to do one hormone at a time. Um, and so that could be estrogen or it could be testosterone. Yeah. I do have a few patients who um, have a contraindication to estrogen, um, unusual cancers, not breast cancers. And I've worked with their oncology team to get the approval to just start testosterone. Mm -hmm. And this woman, and I have a, a few of them that were really suffering. And the testosterone made a significant difference in their hot flashes, their night sweats, mm. their brain function. Mm. Most, most women will comment more clarity in their brain and, um, and their mood and their motivation, their sort of like mojo, yes. their zest for life is back again. Yes. And it and it did mitigate most of their symptoms. Mm. They don't get the benefit of having estrogen for the rest of their life, um, but their quality of life is significantly improved. Absolutely. And it's really interesting because we've looked at our data of adding testosterone in. In fact, you, you were there when I was presenting it. And so half of our patients, we increased estrogen because we thought they had symptoms of estrogen mm -hmm. deficiency. And the other half, we didn't. But the benefits with testosterone were the same across the domain, domain of all symptoms, suggesting that we don't always need to be giving more and more estrogen. It's an mm -hmm. independent hormone. And so, so there are people that will probably benefit from testosterone earlier or you know, maybe to start. And it is so individual. One mm -hmm. of the things that really frustrates me, lots of things frustrate me as you know, Anita, but is that we're talking about a natural hormone. So when we give testosterone, it's exactly the same chemical structure. It's not been modified in any way compared to what we produce our, by our ovaries when we're younger. Yet you and me, so you in America, me in the UK, we don't have a licensed product of testosterone do we so when we say it's licensed you know there are lots of drugs that are licensed um obviously all the antidepressants are licensed painkillers are licensed all sorts of things but testosterone also is licensed for men in the uk is it is it licensed for men in the us it is yeah of course it is like, of course why wouldn't yes. It be? yes so yes. So women who are slightly, as I said at the beginning, slightly over 50% of the population, 
and produce this natural hormone, which is actually the most biologically active hormone we have, mm -hmm. that we produce in higher quantities than estrogen when we're younger and it depletes with time. The deficiency causes all sorts of symptoms and probable health risks as well. Yet we don't have a licensed product. It doesn't quite add up, does it? No, the, the gender disparity there is glaring. Mm. And I think at this point, I, I don't know how close or far away we are because it would take a considerable amount of money for you know a company to decide to do the research and then bring it to the FDA or the FDA to, to run a study. And then they would, they would easily come up with a product, say like a patch like the UK has or uh, like Australia has. Right. We don't have the patch anymore. That, you don't. That was withdrawn um, when the drug companies stopped making them. But we we use the Australian cream. So you do. Cream. OK. So that's what they have, which is licensed in Australia. Um, yes. And they're trying, I think, to get it licensed over here, but it's not really a priority. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it, so we haven't got a licensed product for women. It, so we can still prescribe Andrefen. We're allowed to prescribe it privately. So it's a regulated mm -hmm. product. We can mm -hmm. prescribe it, uh, but women have to pay for it. On the NHS, the National Health Service, we can prescribe the male testosterone, of course, off yes. license because it will be for women in just in lower doses because it's exactly the same hormone, of yes. course, isn't it? So we yes. can just do that. So we're more fortunate than you are in the US, actually. Yes, and and here I fear what would happen if they if somebody does pick this up and does, you know, the the double blind randomized mm. placebo controlled study um, that they'll end up coming up with a product that will be terribly expensive yes. to pay for the, you know, so they'll, yeah, know. they'll kind of put the pink tax on it and it'll be very expensive and, and women won't buy it, you know, because they're going to just get the male generic mm. stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not too expensive. Yes. So I'm just, I don't, I feel a little bit discouraged about if that's going to happen or not. Yeah. Um, and but we other, can prescribe. Yes, we can. And, and the other thing is it comes under in the UK as a control drug because it's an anabolic steroid, Same. which is absolutely ridiculous for women, actually. So men is a different conversation. There are men that can overuse testosterone and it can be an anabolic. All our hormones are steroids, actually. Mm -hmm. so, right. But the amount that we need as women is very low and all we do is replace what's missing so mm -hmm. i don't know about you but we just don't see the side effects that have been reported in our patients the biggest or commonest side effect is some hair growth where the cream is applied on the thigh but we don't see women with beards we don't see women with hairy arms we don't see voice changes we don't see we don't see hair loss we don't see clitoral megaly some people find their clitoris returns because it's it's shrunk without the hormones so that's not yes. the same as clitoral megaly so we don't see these awful side effects so i can't really see that it's working as an anabolic um steroid women often say that they've got more muscle strength they've got more muscle definition because when they exercise it's more efficient Mm -hmm. When we're thinking about long-term health and reducing sarcopenia, this sort of loss of muscle mass, it's really important. Actually. It's very important. But I don't see women with abnormal muscles who are muscularized. It's just not in the doses that we get. I don't see that either. It's no. the, the side effects are very rare and they're dose dependent, I find. Yes. Yeah. You know, so you can easily back off on the dose, the teeny tiny baby, almost homeopathic dose that we give. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. We hardly need any, you know, you can certainly back off on the dose. Um, but I do, um, I echo your, uh, your point about sarcopenia. For instance, I have patients who fall under categories of chronic illness, like multiple sclerosis mm. and Parkinson's. Mm have some other demyelinating neurological disorders, even traumatic brain injury. Um, but especially for the MS patients, the patients who need to stay strong and have their balance, that's very important for them. Yes. Testosterone very much helps with that. Yes. It also helps with their brain function and their, their nervous system. Mm. It's sort of a win-win across the board for those patients and they notice a difference. Yeah. And it is the, the, I've got quite a few patients with 
Parkinson's disease with multiple sclerosis like you and also increasingly with lupus actually and mm -hmm. a lot of someone said to me the other day that she can't have a shower with her eyes closed because she'll fall over so this oh gosh in. yes um, and she's been told it's her lupus and I think I'm sure it's related to testosterone and a lot of people have this uh, POTS uh, this syndrome where they stand up quickly and they feel really mm -hmm. dizzy and that can often really improve with testosterone as well there's this because testosterone gets everywhere so there's a huge amount that we need to do um but in the meantime we haven't got the studies we act on on um clinical um well what we learn in our clinics but also basic science as well and putting the two together is a great privilege and honor being a clinical practitioner like you and i am and helping patients and listening and learning and knowing that what we're doing is safe um so I'm very grateful for your time, Anita. Um, and we haven't really touched on all the other area of longevity and what else to do, because it's not just about hormones. So right. I, I might get you back in a few months' time to talk about, once we have our hormones balanced, how we optimise our future health, because I know you're really amazing and, and passionate on that, like we all are as well. So, But before I finish, I always ask for three take-home tips. Mm -hmm. So three, I'm going to ask you if it's okay, Three things that you would love to say had happened to improve the health of women. So if we met in 20 years' time, what are the three things that you think could make a huge difference for women's health? Uh, I think the education piece. Mm. So women need to educate themselves. They will have to be their own advocate. Yes. Um, I think your book is a great place to start. Oh, thank the you. The Definitive Guide. Yes, it's very good. I would recommend it to anyone at all. Um, so women need to. Ed so women have educated themselves. They have become their own advocates. Um, I, I would love to know that hormones have become available and are affordable. Mm. Like we don't even have vaginal estrogen covered by some right. insurance here, never mind over the counter. So the accessibility mm. to the treatment, to the providers. And then the third thing is the education of the providers. So uh, even a fellowship in menopause, let's do that. You know, yeah. let's, let's get like, start at, you know, med students, start at nurse practitioner students, start very, very early. So they understand that menopause and sexual medicine is very important for our for our lifespan our health span really more yeah. so i totally agree i couldn't agree more and it's changing the narrative as to what our hormones are not being scared embracing yes. them know the, the beneficial effects that that we have when we have our hormones so thank you so much i've really enjoyed it today so thanks anita thanks for having me louise it was really nice to see you again You can find out more about Newson Health Group by visiting www.newsonhealth.co.uk and you can download the free Balance app on the App Store or Google Play.